So we are doing another special guest DGU episode today with Kaylee Edmondson. Kaylee works at Brightwheel right now as a director of demand generation, and you probably know her from her days at Chili Piper and hosting the Demand Gen Chat. She was a senior director of Demand Gen there. Kaylee and I will talk about the role of influencer marketing in B2B. Everyone knows it's been around in B2C for forever, and it started to make its way over to B2B in the last few years. Kaylee's got some really interesting experience in B2B influencer marketing, and we've also been working with Dave Gerhardt lately, so this should be a good one. Demand Gen U is officially in session. Let's do it. Kaylee, this is going to be fun today, not to air out your dirty laundry, but I think you may have said that this was the most that you've prepped for a podcast before. Is that true? Oh, it's so true. Here's the deal. I normally accept uh, like invitations and I literally have nothing. Like I just joined and I'm like, I hope they ask great questions because I don't know. I can riff with a brick wall. Um, But yeah, I actually wrote notes for this one. So let's hope that that's like a sign of, I don't know, a sign of success and doesn't make it like worse. (laughs) No, we can't go backwards. And we were just talking about this before we kicked the episode off. I think this should be pretty good. And uh, we're definitely expecting this one to be a little bit more conversational today. Uh, Kaylee is a badass. Uh, If you don't know her, we've been meeting together lately and uh, basically just holding each other accountable and and calling each other out on our shit, uh, kind of as like a peer mentor. So we should do an episode on that after we, I don't know, get a few more meetings under our belt. We should. Totally. Alrighty. So let's cut to the chase. I think when people hear influencers, or at least I do, they think of all the garbage that's on Instagram in the B2C world. Everyone thinks of B2C and B2C only. And the good news is it started to change over the last couple of years. So before we get into all that good stuff, how do you define influencer marketing? Yeah, I know. I think you've like set it up really, really good. Here's the deal. Like we all know that like people buy a certain kind of golf club because Tiger Woods uses it or he doesn't, right? If you're not a Tiger fan, whatever. Um, or you buy a certain, oh my gosh, I didn't even know. <laughs> no, it's I promise broken. that it, wasn't it, reversed. No, no, it was not. Uh, it's broken. I have to go get it fixed today, but all right, keep going. Perfect. Right. So it's like you bought that because maybe you're a Tiger Woods fan. I really don't know why I chose a golf analogy because I'm not a golfer, but um, like it's been happening in the B2C world for years and you like as a consumer have been like falling into this buying like psychology forever. Um, So yeah, it's like it, like we are with every channel B2B is behind, but here we are trying to like step up to the plate and catch up um, on influencer marketing. And it's really just like, we want to trust and believe in those that we um, like, uh, you know, have something in common with, right? It's like, I really love Simone Biles. I used to be a gymnast when I was younger. So it's like, if she wants to back a certain skincare product, I'm X percent more likely to be like, oh, yes, I would like to try that as well. Um, And I think it's all about finding common ground. And we already have some layer of trust with these quote unquote influencers in our consumer mindset. So like, let's bring that same psychology over into the B2B world. And I think that's what uh, marketers today are trying to like keep up with and learn to implement in the B2B space. Yeah. And I think for me, you touched on a couple different things, but it's all about knowing and liking and trusting these people and you don't really know them personally i would say most of the time uh, but you look up to them or want to be like them in some way so whenever they recommend something it holds a little bit more weight at least for me uh when i'm looking at you know if it's let's use golf if it's certain golfers uh if it's somebody recommending like you know apparel that they wear or in a b2b context if it's somebody saying you know they had a really good experience with this piece of software It's just the third party validation that seems to be more believable in some ways when it's coming from people and not the company who's trying to get you to buy whatever they're selling. That's what I was going to say. I think that's the point. It's like the accredit, like they are more accredited, right? It's more authentic um, because they are hopefully like really a user of this skincare product or this B2B software or whatever the case may be. And they are giving a true testimony to what they think about it, what they like, maybe what they don't like, all of those things. Um, and that's the power of influencer marketing. And yeah, we're just trying to catch up to what B2C figured out probably like 70 years ago. Yeah. And this is going to be a tough question because I don't even know if I can remember my own answer, but when do you feel like you first came across influencer marketing or at least you remember it? I feel like probably like five years or so ago, but the difference is that it was really being like a playbook that was run by the big dogs, especially in software. 
um, like Salesforce, like those level of players were the people that were really like already playing that way. And I think there are like several reasons as to like why like smaller players hadn't entered that field yet. And we can definitely get into that too. But I would say probably like five to seven years ago was like, but only like 1% of the people were doing it. And even then, like maybe not doing it the best. Yeah, I think for me, at least in a, a B2C context, I almost think of it more as endorsements. And I mean, influencer marketing is kind of like you're endorsing something at the end of the day. But I always think back to, you know, I had to go the the golf route again, but Tiger Woods endorsing something or any big mm-hmm. athlete who was endorsing something. It was like, oh, wait, if it's good enough for them, it's more than good enough for me. So I think that was my first time coming across it in a B2C world. And then in the B2B world, I think... I don't know. I like I I think it was the 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 mammoth enterprise software company is definitely mm-hmm. within the last like let's say 5 to 10 years. I don't know specifically of one of those companies, but I feel like they had the budget at first to do it because it was so like insanely expensive. It's still expensive depending on who you're trying to get to influence these days, but I think the cost has come down a little bit too. Yeah, I think so. I would agree with that. So Let's get into some of your experience on this and check me on this. But you, when we were talking about this topic, I think it was when you were at, was it Campaign Monitor when you were first dabbling into some of this? Like give us the yeah. the Cliff Notes version or the non-Cliff Notes version of what you guys were doing at Campaign Monitor because I thought it was really interesting. Yeah, I love that you know that I don't have Cliff Notes in me. So it's just like, it's going to be the long version and you can interrupt me as I go. Um, Yeah, so I think I was at Campaign Monitor in like 2018. Campaign Monitor was interesting in and of itself because obviously in the email marketing space, we were going head to head with MailChimp. So we had a lot of um, market share to make up. Um, While I was there, uh, we we ended up getting around to funding. Our investors started acquiring some of the smaller... um, ESPs in the space. And one of those ESPs and brands that we ultimately ended up folding under the campaign monitor umbrella was a brand that was local to Nashville, which for anybody that doesn't know is like also where I am from and based. Um, so I was very familiar with this brand, but it was called Emma. They were also an ESP. Um, and Emma in particular was the brand that we decided to stand up influencer marketing for and try. Um, and we can talk about like all the details for what that actually looked like, but we ended up going, um, the macro influencer route. I think there are tons of routes that you can try and like tackle the the programming around influencer marketing. And at the time, you think about in 2018, like what was Actually, the space? What did can the, I let me oh, interrupt yeah. for one second? Uh, asking for a friend, aka me. How are you defining macro influencer and micro influencer? Ooh, but I think that's all dependent on your TAM. So like you as a marketer need to like address your TAM and then figure out what your macro influencers are. So for us at the time, our space was obviously like marketers. We were trying to market to marketers and email marketing uh, solution. There were It's a very crowded space, just email marketing in general, but our TAM was pretty large as well. For us at the time, a macro influencer, and of course, like it was early on in general, so a lot of B2B uh, leaders didn't have a ton of followers. The threshold for us back then was 100,000 followers or greater. Um, but I think that if you're in like a more niche industry, you might not have anybody in your industry that's talking about um, something that your buyers will find applicable that has 100,000 followers even today, right? So I think the, like your macro, micro, or mid, like all needs to be determined based on your own assessment of the industry um, and how many like active players you have that are serving as thought leaders in that industry. I love that answer because it's always the best answers are depends and it depends on your industry instead of just some huge blanket statement. So I dig it. Yeah. No, but I really think it does, right? Because if you're going after like, I don't know, maybe like a much more technical buyer, like, I don't know, an engineer or something, like you probably need to understand like, oh, well, if this engineer only knows Scala, then it's like, we need to find somebody who's also talking about Scala. So I think it's like, it is going to depend, right? And it's like, I'm, you know, if you're marketing to medical professionals, there's no telling what types of caveats or like segments you really have within that. Um, so yeah, just know that, yeah, it does depend. And I think it's really based on your own like TAM. So for us, we were like a hundred thousand or greater is macro at the time you think about like back to 2018, like digital marketing was definitely around, but thought leadership through like personal branding wasn't as like apparent or obvious as it is today. 
But you think about like what these like quote unquote influencers were really doing. They were like on the conference circuit. That was what was big back then. Like marketing conferences, they're a dime a dozen. Like especially back then, pre-COVID, there were so many marketing conferences and marketers love to be social and love to get out and attend conferences. So like that's where all of our buyers were. And that's where we decided to go with three macro influencers. That's where all of these macro influencers were spending the majority of their time. They were all on 20, 30, 40 circuits a year, like attending really large conferences um, and speaking, right? They all had keynotes. Um, so that was like part That's of our like selection. It's like a full-time job for them. Yeah. <laughs> no, it really is. Like, and it was, we can talk about like who it was. We decided yeah. to partner with Scott Stratton, Ann mm -hmm. Hanley, and Jay Bear, who are all professional speakers. They're all professional keynotes. Now they, two of them have started their own companies. I guess all of them really have started their own companies. Um, like Ann Hanley is the CCO of Marketing Profs, which is a well-known marketing uh, like professional community that's been around for years. Um, Scott Stratton is the founder of Unmarketing, uh, which is really a brand that was created all about like tearing down the myths to successful marketing. And he goes and does keynotes for all types of industries around that. And then Jay Bayer, of course, he's got a digital agency, Convince and Convert. So it's like, those were our players, right? And we just selected those three for all the reasons for just where the market was at the time. Um, lots of learnings throughout. And then like, of course, lots of discrepancies between how we actually worked with each of them. So a couple questions and then we can go from there. So I think the first question I have is how did you, or did you get feedback from your own customers or your target audience at the end of the day that like those were the right influencers that they would respond well to? Yeah, absolutely. No, every year, I think most companies do some level of this depending on like sophistication, but every year, Emma, which was a smaller brand at the time, would send out an annual customer survey, uh, like baseline questions, right? Like, what do you love about the product? What do you hate about it? Where could we be better? What do, what features you use the most? Which features have you like never even looked at? All those types of things about the product. But then also we would send a segment to prospects and customers. Where do you hang out? Who do you follow online? Where do you find value? Like, all of those types of questions to really understand, like maybe new communities are popping up or like new at the time, I'm sure it wasn't communities, but you know what I mean? Maybe new like uh, websites are popping up where people are finding real value. Like we need to be there. Originally, we sent out those surveys to be there in a digital presence, right? So that we could make sure we could get digital sponsorships and media placements with these third party like placements. But then once we came up with this idea to launch influencers, we were like, actually, we could just use the same census and in insights and figure out how to actually like team up with these people. So really it was all pulled directly from our census feedback. And again, I'm sure people like at very sophisticated companies do like market studies with like analysts, but there's definitely a way to like hack it together and be much more scrappy in like anything as simple as like a Google form. I mean, that's what we do. You can still get legit right. feedback by asking, you know, 10, 15, 20 people in your audience. Sure. Are those studies super helpful? Yeah. Are they also incredibly expensive? Yeah. And you like, you just don't need to do that to validate things like this. Exactly. So I hate to ask this question, but I know everyone probably is thinking it. Measurement. Measurement is one of those oh, things God. that, you know, no matter what you are doing from a marketing perspective, somebody, whether it's on the leadership team or your boss or somebody else is going to be like, all right, how do we measure this? So how did you approach that part of this? Or did you at all? And did you just say, screw measurement? Right. No, I think that's like the place where marketers really mess up is like, if you back yourself into this corner and say, oh, but like, we can only move forward if we know for sure we can measure it is like one plus one equals two. Like marketing isn't a one plus one equals two kind of game and influencer marketing. If whenever you start actually moving to anything outside of like a direct response game, you just don't track it. Like that's the truth. You just don't not in the traditional way. So I can't wait. I, to, I can't, fortunate. I cannot wait to turn that into a social clip because it couldn't be more true. Yes. No, keep going. It couldn't be more true. But like, I think that at the time I was very fortunate. My boss had spent seven years of his career leading brand for Red Bull, which like maybe you've heard of it, which probably means he did was great at leading brand for Red Bull. Um, and he had come to, to lead and he was the VP of marketing um, when I was here working for this brand. And he obviously had a lot of like different mentalities than anybody really that I had reported to, especially in a SaaS like demand gen role. Um, and he, he was not pressuring us for reporting, which is great. It allowed us this freedom to like jump off the cliff 
and just take a leap of faith and say, hey, we've identified these three partners. Like we really believe for all of these reasons that they are our people. Let's not set like strict guardrails around it. And we didn't. Over time, we did find ways to develop like self-reported attribution um, or campaign level attribution for certain activations that we ended up doing with these partners. But there wasn't like one holistic Salesforce campaign where it's like, if it's not in there, then it's not successful. That's ultimately just like not how we approached it at all. And honestly, like, I feel like if you're trying to do the, like, we spent $2, we're getting $4 back. Don't do it. (laughs) You're never, you're like, it's never going to work. You can like stop before you even get started because it's not going to work. So uh, you mentioned your old boss and having, uh, we were looking at his LinkedIn profile when we were riffing on the topic and he had a pretty interesting background. So what were some of the things that looking back, he brought over from Red Bull that changed the way that you would approach something like this? Because not many bosses work for, you know, a B2C brand like that and also a B2C brand that has insane awareness. Yeah, I know exactly. And I think too, at the time, it's so funny. It's like, this is one of my like best learnings, I think in my career is like, we didn't agree on anything in early days because I had a strict like B2B SaaS background, always in a performance-based role where leaders were looking to me, you know, and obviously I was very much an IC. This was very early in my career where I was like taught these principles around like dollar in, dollar out, everything needs to be measured. And, you know, I thought I was a really great, like I see at that point, right? I was like, no, no, no. Like um, his name was AK, shout out AK. He was like, AK, we can't do this. Like we cannot, I don't know how I'm going to measure this. I was actually concerned about it, but believed in it. So I was like quite torn at the time. Um, And he was like, here's the thing, Kaylee, like you just can't expect it. And here's why he's like, He talked me through some of the campaigns that they'd run at Red Bull, how many, you know, the ridiculous amounts of dollars that they had spent on it and how they ultimately attributed success. And it was all through like a self-reported attribution model, which at the time we didn't have such a direct naming convention for it, but it was a very tactical approach of like, okay, here's the thing. We're going to partner with Scott Stratton. We know that he's going to this city, this city, this city, this city. And we know that we're going to do a book signing. We're going to do a whatever. Um, one of our first like activations was a book signing. So we ordered some of his books. We had him sign them. We had him come to our booth. Our booth had hundreds of people after his keynote lining up to take pictures, had them sign the book. We took pictures. I'll have to go find them so you can like post them later. But hundreds of people wrapped around the conference. We were like causing like real disruption. And he like pulled me aside and he was like, Kaylee, this is your attribution right here. Uh, This is your success. I love that. And I was like, oh, like, and, but I didn't like get it until we were like in it. And he was like, this, this is marketing like around you right now. Everybody was coming up. I love Emma. I love Scott Stratton. Like the word, we were just standing there like in awe, like listening. Of course he knew it was going to play out like this. I was like, just like dumbfounded the whole time. Like this is so <laughs> awesome. But that was my first like real experience for like creating disruption in a space. And it's like, that's attribution. From there, we went on to do like a series of events with him where we would actually have marketers, but also sales reps, like attending smaller base, like niche conferences Mm -hmm. with Scott Stratton, like as our keynote, we would record podcasts with him because he had a podcast back in the day. He was ahead of his time, Oh my god, yeah. like all of those things. And we would have one off like reporting stents where we would say like, this was the feedback we were hearing. This is qualitative information from the event. Like, These are the types of people that we were granted like access to have conversations with because they were actually coming to talk with Scott, but they were standing in line and couldn't do anything. So we would just go up and have conversations with them while they're waiting to meet with him. From there, we would attract like all this valuable information about them, who they are, how they use email. Like it was so like so valuable that he's like, this is our ROI. This is all we need. And like that's what gave us like the jumping point Mm -hmm. to go and then partner with Anne and with Jay. Gotcha. So you started off with him first and then did you go immediately to the two others and work with them at the same time or was it kind of gradual at the same time no at the same time like we had proven enough with scott to where we're like this is it like this is going to work for us um so then we went and found two additional partners and it was ann and jay was there anything that you learned uh from working with ann and jay that was different from the scott experience or was it more or less kind of the the same things that were playing out No, I think it was very different. Like each of them actually ended up having very bespoke contracts with us because they're all three very different people. So Scott, like 
he, I, the best way to describe it is like he was ready to marry Emma, the brand. He just loved <laughs> Emma. Like, he used Emma for like his ESP. He had a newsletter. He obviously had a podcast. Emma sponsored the podcast. We were like wrapped around his mic. We were his backdrop for like his video recordings. Like he was ready to marry Emma. He was like it's such a great partner to choose to, to like start this with because we could see like you know, you just ask and he's like, yes, I'd love to do that. Right. Like I had no background in like contract negotiation or like building bespoke contracts. And I was like, just leading the charge as like his PO, like POC. And I was like, I don't know. Like, I mean, do you want to do this? Do you want to do that? And he's like, yes, I would love to. So it was almost like testing boundaries with Scott, yep. which like in a way spoiled me because then when I went to have a conversation with Anne, my first conversation with her, she, you know, I remember like calling around to everybody, just trying to figure out how to get this lady on the phone. She finally calls me back one day. I'm like, oh my gosh, I run into a conference room and I'm like, and this is Kaylee. I was like, you probably don't know who I am, but like, hit it up. And she was like, here's the thing, Kaylee. Like, I really respect your like grit and like how, you know, like aggressive you've been at trying to get in touch with me. But like, I don't do these kinds of partnerships. And in my head, I was like, oh my gosh, like, what have I just done? Um, I just remember being like, so like, I don't know, just like down yeah. and the minute she said it. I'm like, okay, okay, no worries. And so I'm like, thank you so much for your time. Cool. I go back to my desk and I'm like, okay, how can we figure out how to make this work? Like we have to partner with this lady. So I started following her on Instagram. I started engaging with her content. Like I truly was also a fan of hers. So I actually flew out to a conference in North Carolina at the time that she was mm -hmm. speaking at and met her after her keynote and was like, can I take you to lunch? <laughs> she was like, are you kidding? She's like, oh of my God, so we go to lunch. I respect the hell yeah. out of that. I love this. Keep going. <laughs> we go, we go to lunch. We have a great conversation. I mean, I just love this woman. Like, especially me, I'm young in my career. She is like very established and like so brilliant. She always wears these really badass like pantsuits when she does speaking engagements. I'm like, I just want to be her. <laughs> so I really was like selfishly just like, this is a great conversation for me in my career, but like also, I really want to land you. So like, how can we make this work? And at the end of the lunch, we just honestly riffed. We had just a great natural conversation about her career and what she's done and, you know, my quote unquote career. But I was like, definitely not. I had no idea what I was really doing. I was like, this is like what I think I want to be when I grow up. It was just a great conversation. At the end, she's like, I'm willing to do an engagement. Like, let's start with a book signing. And I was like, yes. I just remember like calling AK after that conference. And I'm like, yes, I'm headed home. I was in North Carolina for less than 24 hours. I was headed home. She agreed to do a book signing. I'm like, yes. So we set it up. It went so well. She agreed to do like an actual formal contract with us, but her contract did look different from Scott's, right? Scott was ready to marry us and was willing to partner with us, but it was very different. Uh, that story is amazing. And I would, just so everybody knows, was completely unscripted. So we did not, we did not plan for that story, but I love that. Uh, it's like the, uh, I saw, when was it? I don't know. It was within the last couple of months, but it was whenever that dude was climbing Salesforce Tower uh, in San Francisco. Did you see this? Oh, yeah. And then people I were did. turning it into a, like a meme and it was, you know, an SDR in the 15th email like, hey, I'm coming to book the meeting. You know, I'm willing to climb. <laughs> Not that you're that crazy, but it feels like it's a distant relative, but I respect it. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, I think that, you know, at the time I'm like, would I actually still do that today? I don't know. But I, I think it was just like a mix of like, look, I've seen this work with Scott. I like know it's going to work with Anne. Yeah. Like she will reach. Yeah. I was like, I just feel that she will be such a good partner for us. And like equally, like we would be a good partner for her. So I'm like, not that we, we were definitely the small fish. She had like, she had everything and she knew like she held the cards, mm -hmm. but I'm like, I think we'd be a great partners together. Like this really works. Like she really matched our brand archetype as did Scott, mm -hmm. as did Jay. And I was like, there just aren't going to be that many players that like meet our like must haves yep. and then plus some like on the bonus front. And I just like had to like, I had to figure out how to, a way to make it work. And was just like so thrilled that day when it actually all fell together. I was like, oh my gosh, this is Talk great. about a roller coaster from where you started from her saying, you know, hey, I don't do this to <laughs> leaving North Carolina. Yeah, That's amazing. So now I'm curious, you had all that influencer experience at Campaign Monitor. Did you start to do anything like that with influencer marketing when you were at Chili Piper? Yeah, well, I think we did, but I think we took a much different approach. So like, obviously fast forward, like 2018 was Campaign Monitor Days, 20, oh gosh, I think I joined like the week or the week after the pandemic started. So like 2020 um, was Chili Piper Days and it's like, okay, well now the world is very different. Um, obviously at Chili Piper, we were still going after marketers, but we were going after 
a very different buying committee um, because of where Chili Piper sits within most organizations. The buying committee was like not just as simple as like marketers. We are your we are your software. Here's the thing. So we we and we definitely didn't start from the beginning, right? So like in early days at Chili Piper, we needed to figure out like who we are, how we talk about ourselves, like what our value props are, like all of those things before we could ever think about influence marketing. And I think that's like a a smart step to take. Like if I had to do it over again, I would do it in that same like order of operations. Um, before you start bringing, especially like external members into your fold, like you really need to know like who you are, why you're here, what you're doing, like what your value is. Because then you think about it, you're basically doing enablement at scale to external people who aren't in your internal meetings and aren't like having daily conversations back and forth with the marketing team or whoever to riff on like how we talk about ourselves, whatever. So they're like, two degrees removed from like anything that's being said internally. And you have to nail that first. So that's where we started at Chili Piper. But by the end of it, uh, it wasn't as strategic. I'll say that. It definitely wasn't as strategic as like, hey, let's stand up a contract. Let's like sign on the dotted line. Let's pay you this much money. We actually went the like unpaid route um, at Chili Piper and ended up doing all of our evangelism through almost like through our cab really, but it was very organic. Um, and it wasn't like a, you know, like a sales call. Basically I was like a glorified SDR at campaign monitor where I'm like, Hey, let me get on a sales call. Let me get my pitch together. Let me figure out how we're going to do this and how much we're going to pay you. Like I'll get billing set up. Like it wasn't that at Chili Piper at all. And I think that was the right move for us at the time. So macro at Chili or at campaign monitor, but micro, um, at Chili Piper like worked better for us. So let's talk about that for a sec, though, because one of the the things that I wanted to cover is this notion that influencer marketing always has to be paid. And it does not in my eyes. And it sounds like you guys saw some success with like, you know, non-paid influencer marketing called evangelism, call it whatever you want. Yeah, I actually think it's better if you can actually get it unpaid. Am I wrong? Like if it's unpaid, these people like truly love you. And I mean, honestly, we could even talk about like what I ended up doing for y'all. You didn't pay me for that back in the day. I wanted to write an article uh, about like software that I actually find value. That in. was the and didn't talk that to was you guys. One of didn't my, ask like, for your permission. My of all of the crazy like positive metadata marketing moments that I have right now, seeing that blog post come through, I was like, holy shit. We didn't even ask her to do this. Yeah. <laughs> it was amazing. Yeah. And at the time, like we weren't like, yeah, for for anybody that's listening, like Mark and I weren't friends. Like I wasn't friends with Jason. Like I was a customer of metadata early on at that. I think I was like a couple months in yeah. and had genuinely already seen impact. And I was like, you know, obviously I was already like publishing things and like trying to provide value online under my own name. And I was like, this would be such an easy article to write. Like, and it like we had already found so much value with metadata that I was just like, cranked it out and pressed go. And I remember like y'all's team was like, wait, what? We didn't know. And I'm like, yeah, well, maybe I should have. Like, no, no, FYI, no. But, like, it, you know? Hindsight's 2020. I love the way that it played out. Cause if there was an FYI, I still would have been excited, but it was not as jarring in a positive way. <laughs> sure. Yeah. And I think that like, honestly, some of those relationships started to happen for us at Chili Piper too, where we were just having real conversations with other marketers like myself, Dan Schmela, like the leadership team on the marketing side was just having conversations with smart marketers. And these people were starting to like fall in love with us, fall in love with our brand, fall in love with our product. And we're just starting to post about it naturally online. And we're like, wait, what? This is so weird, but like wonderful. So then we're like, wow, we really feel like we should like, I mean, acknowledge these people in like a one-off way to be like, wow, thank you so much. It started with that. And then it grew into like, actually, like you have great feedback about our product. Do you want to be on our cab, our customer advisory board? We'd love to like harness this in, in a productive way where we can actually like take your feedback and implement it into our product roadmap in real time based on like what you're seeing and learning and saying about our, you know, shortcomings and our like areas of opportunities. Like let's win on that so that you guys continue to be evangelists for us. It became just really natural cyclical like product feedback loop where they were then like so pumped about us and our brand that they were willing to go and do more and say more and talk to more people. It also serves as like a great feedback loop for anybody that does need a customer referral when they're on like the last stage of the op and just like aren't ready to commit to being close one yet. And it's like, do you want to chat with somebody? We've got a handful of people over here that like love us. We can pass you off to any of them. Um, so yeah, it was just like, I think that the flywheel for whatever that's worth at Chili Piper was like far bigger than what we actually ended up unlocking at Campaign Monitor because like the 
the, the ways in which we could use those insights throughout our actual like pipeline and sales funnel was just a lot more efficient than what we ended up doing at CM. So it's like, I even think in that aspect, like there's a lot of progress that was made. So that's kind of how we got started. I don't want to say it was intentional at the time, but that's how we got started with, you know, influencer marketing at Metadata. So this would have been the summer, uh, I think it was last summer actually. And we were still Mm -hmm. a team of two. It was Jason and myself with some freelance help, but we needed to get more content out the door. So what did I do? I started to reach out to people who I thought were influencers in B2B marketing and stood up like a guest blog series, called it (laughs) No Fluffs Given, uh, which uh, I love. Uh, It was probably one of my favorite titles that I've come up with, shameless plug. Uh, What company can you work (laughs) at where they openly encourage uh, content series titles like that? But uh, I think the coolest part was I built relationships with a lot of those people So then when, Mm -hmm. you know, demand came around last year or we do other events uh, like the Emmy Awards or whatever it may be, you've already built that relationship with those people so that when you ask again in the future and, you know, always giving something in return, they say yes. And you're tapping into their audiences, their followings. The second that they post something like Devin just posted about speaking at demand again this year, what happened within the first couple minutes of him posting about that on LinkedIn. I get all the HubSpot notifications that people are signing up. So it's like, Mm -hmm. how can you build relationships with people to then tap into their audiences? And like, you have to do it sincerely and not with a hidden agenda. And we're playing the long game, but I think as long as you play the long game, you can do this really well and not have to pay for it. Yeah, no, I think so too. And I think too, that's why I like people get into this like test mode, right? Around like, oh, I'd like to test influencer marketing or like figure out how to stand up this programming. And like, maybe they give it a quarter, maybe two quarters. And it's like, no way. Like you're never going to actually see like the long-term momentum of what this channel and this like programming could really do for your brand. Because you're one, you're like not even going to make meaningful relationships in that amount of time, right? Like at this point, I think like I've been riffing with y'all for, I guess almost- is it almost two years so. or something? Yeah, it's been a long yeah. time, right? And I'm like, now you're like a daily part of what I'm doing. I'm like, I don't know, I'll ask Mark. But like a year, like three months in, that would have never been my first reaction, right? Yeah. And so it's like, that's just not how it's going to work long term. And I think too, you guys obviously have also been partnering with DG. Like talk to me about kind of how that like came up. Yeah, so I think I've mentioned it a little bit on another episode that we did. But the the funny part is if you hadn't listened to that episode So Gil, our CEO, wanted to get more out there on LinkedIn and kind of build his own presence. And I really just kept annoying him. I was like, hey, you should work with this guy named Dave Gerhardt in this. Like he's looking to work with CEOs who get marketing, all that stuff. And I just kept annoying him and annoying him and annoying him. And he finally started. That's kind of my strategy. Usually I need to pick a different one, but it works. (laughs) And they hit it off really well right out of the gate. So uh, I'll never forget this. It was like November-ish of last year. I was on a one-on-one with Gil and he was like, hey, so I'm thinking about bringing Dave on as an advisor. And I was like, Dave Gerhardt? He's like, "Uh, yeah, like I think he could be great. And I was like, holy shit, this is unbelievable. So we brought him on, you know, in an advisor capacity. Uh, It's paid. I can't get into the specifics of it, but mostly because I don't know the specifics. Uh, (laughs) It's It is one of those things where Gil knows the value that it brings us because of how influential he is in just B2B marketing in general. So to your point earlier about measurement, how we measure it, we don't really try to quantify it. There are things that we do try to measure on self-reported attribution and then gong trackers that we set up, but it's incredible how many people come to us that say, Hey, I heard about it in Exit 5. I saw one of Dave's posts on LinkedIn. Uh, I heard or I read your press release that you're partnering with Dave Gerhardt. You know, that's so cool. What do you guys do again? And it's not great when they're like, what do you do again? But it gets your foot in the door. And that's the whole point of influencer marketing in the first place. Exactly. No, that's the whole point. So I think that it's like, yeah, I think there are so many takeaways, though, even just from like that, that it's like, the measurement is like the least important. I think that if you're approaching it where it's like, oh, we can't proceed unless we can measure, you should stop. It's like, instead you should ask yourself like, does this person like 
match our brand, right? I think there's like some level of importance there around like how they are as in their personal brand online. Does that match and jive with you? Because otherwise you're going to end up standing up all these weird like guardrails between like, hey, you cuss like a sailor and we really believe in being like the um, the hero brand and like, yep. you know, we can't, we can't proceed. You know, you end up standing up all these odd guardrails if you don't like match. So like finding people that just yep. get it and understand you and your brand. And that's just how they are authentically understanding their followers who actually engages with them. Are those your people? Does this person have some kind of unique angle and can provide value that supports your product and also is like true to who they are? Like, yes, no. I think those are some of like the early, like easy parameters that you can suss out when you're going into the wild to try and figure out who in this market you should like select as, uh, as one of your. Yeah. Partners. And it, it is in, like, I think the definition of a two-way street with this Dave Gerhardt partnership for us, because he was trying to vet us as well for all of those things that you just mentioned too. Mm-hmm. So like we were vetting him, he was vetting us and he wanted to make sure. And, and so did we, that it was a good fit on both sides, because if we have, it's my podcast, so I can say whatever I want. Uh, if we did like Neil Patel or something like that, like our audience doesn't care about him. <laughs> like, sorry, Neil Patel, but like that, like, sure, he would probably right. take our business, but would our audience listen to him at the end of the day? Like, probably not. Does he fit with how we market ourselves? Absolutely not. So sorry for shitting on him, but I think it was a good example. <laughs> I mean, I guess I did like softball that yeah. over to you and you decided to yeah. hit it. So I'm like, okay, that's fair. Um, but no, I think it's it's important because it's like, that's how you can like ruin it from the beginning. And like, that's when you're going to get into this mode of like, oh, how do we measure this? We've partnered with Neil and like things don't feel like they're working. And like, well, that's right. Because you like messed up before you even really got started. I think the vetting process is like the most important process. And getting that alignment up front, right? It's like, we found out early on, like Scott was willing, willing to marry us. We could ask him for a lot of things. Anne was a little bit more tailored because she obviously needs to be more brand agnostic than what Scott needed to be in just in her line of work and how she needs to present herself um, publicly. So I think that's all like super important learnings before you go and spend $100,000 with a major influencer and then have nothing to <laughs> yes, show for Yes, so it. if you take, hopefully people take a couple of things away from this, but if you take one thing, the first move should not be the 100K influencer right out of the gate. I think to both of our points, I think you can play the long game and try to, uh, play the non-paid influencer marketing route and see how that goes and then take learnings from that before you fork over some serious coin because the macro influencers in you know our space and other spaces it ain't cheap <laughs> it ain't cheap and I think too like tailor it to where your people are right like in 2018 we didn't have the luxury of saying hey let's partner with micro influencers on their LinkedIn profiles like, I mean, people would have had 400 followers a piece. That would have never, like, not that it's all about, like, quantity, because it's not. There's definitely a blend of quality. But, like, 400 players a piece wouldn't have really moved the needle for a brand that was already pretty well known. Um, so it's, like, I think, too, like, think about, like, the luxuries or the quick wins that you have in your space. Like, where do these people actually hang out? Maybe it's, like, these people are all over Reddit or these people are really on TikTok or, like, whatever your thing is, like, tailor it to that audience. So like back then we, I felt like we had to go macro at the time because that's what the market linery is like right at our fingertips where you really can like suss out strategic partnerships with micro influencers at better scale. And you're like leaving less on the table, right? If you're partnering with a micro influencer and it doesn't work, like it's a lot easier to like, okay, take those learnings, move on, um, figure out like what worked, what didn't work. And then like assign it, like work it better for the next person you decide to partner with. That's actually an unreal point because when we were thinking about like who we should get for outside help for some of the marketing stuff that we were working on, obviously Dave's resume speaks for itself, but also our audience at the end of the day lives on LinkedIn. So we knew he is one of the biggest voices on LinkedIn. Therefore, we went where our audience is. If our audience, let's say I was at a different company and for whatever reason, YouTube was big, like then you'd probably go to YouTube. YouTubers, although I feel like a boomer saying that, and go find people who are really big in that channel or to your point, Reddit or Twitter or something, because each of these people, they don't have the same reach on every single okay. channel. So you got to figure out where your audience is and like what that number one channel is to double down on, because really we're in a couple channels right now. We're not trying to do the shotgun approach. Yeah, no, I think that's totally fair. All right. Well, this was awesome. We could keep going, but 
I don't think uh, Riverside will let us keep going. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. We're trying to stay within time today. Kaylee, I love talking with you. As always, this was great. We'll have to have you back on Demand Gen U in a couple months and we'll do another Beautiful. episode. Let's do it. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening, guys. We'll see you next week.